Well, the sermon this morning couldn't be more appropriate considering Kip's accident and our concern for him and his health. Um, But I promise you that this was just part of the plan all along because, as you know, I'm preaching through the book of the Gospel of Luke, and this is where we were at, so it's very appropriate. Um, And it's another lesson to us that God's planning is so perfect. He gives us just what we need when we need it. So I pray that as we go through this uh, story together from the narratives we find in Luke's gospel that you will be encouraged this morning. In a sense, the story we're going to be looking at is a story kind of 12 years in the making. And it's a story that has a subplot within it. Just in this short story, there's the, the plot and the subplot. But um, we'll find that really there was no subplot. All of it's the main plot. You know, the really great writers can write in ways where uh, the subplot weaves in and you didn't even know it was going to. And uh, this is one of those things that you're just amazed at the timing of God that he had this worked out for the benefit of those he loves. So before I read the passage, we'll just remember from our last lesson, there's a big contrast from the end of that uh, passage and this one because in the end of the last passage, the people, the Gerasene people, they want Jesus to leave. After he cast the demons out of the, the man or the two men, and the demons went into the pigs, and the pigs went over the cliff. We talked about that last week, and all they wanted was Jesus to get out of here, please. I don't know if they said please, but uh, they wanted him to leave. And in great contrast to that, we see today a group of people who is is excited about Jesus being there. And in particular, we're going to see the humility of two people who are seeking help from Jesus, two of, both of them having a story that goes back 12 years. One of them had a 12-year-old daughter, and one of them had a 12-year-old affliction. Let's read it together, and then we'll talk about it. I will read as you follow along, and it Hopefully you have your Bibles with you. If not, it'll be on the screen. Starting at verse 40 of Luke chapter 8, and then through the end of the chapter. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. After, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you. And are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive the power, that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And, he went to, and he, when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the mother and father of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them not to tell 
He charged them to tell no one what had happened. All right, here's your big idea this morning. And you're going to see this on the screen at least several times because I want you to remember this. Jesus responds to faith that is weak and desperate. Jesus responds to faith that is weak and desperate. And three sub points, if you want them, is we're going to talk about Jesus allows for interruptions, Jesus has compassion, and Jesus cares for practical needs. So we have here a story within a story. As I mentioned, it's a story 12 years in the making. But really, it was a story that was written before time itself because God had planned this story well ahead of time. An author writes a subplot to keep the reader engaged, but I don't know if you're like me. I I love the old classics, and I know people think that's weird. I like Dickens, and I like The County of Monte Cristo, and I like all these old, old, old novels, Les Miserables, those things. And they have many, many subplots Little stories within a story. And as you're reading, there's times where you're even reading this little story within a story, and you're like, what does it have to do with the... Let me get back to the main story. And some people actually skip those chapters. Because they're like, I don't see why this has anything to do with it. I'm going to skip. And they miss out at the end because they're really great authors. They, they weave them together. And at the very end, you have this story within a story. And you were thinking back in chapter 18... What in the world does this have to do with it? And these are the kind of books I read. And now you're in chapter 122 or whatever it is. And that's kind of coming to a conclusion. And all of a sudden you're like, aha, I remember that. And this character comes into the picture and and out. The very best storyteller the world has ever known is our Heavenly Father who planned out all of these stories, including the one I just read, which is a beautiful story. And if you are in Christ, part of his story is your story. You're the subplot that is actually the plot. So the author does that. They they may do the subplot to keep interest. They may be building something for later. You don't always know. But the great author ties it all together. God has written all, so his subplot ties into the main point. The main point is the salvation arc of the story. I have a wife that's a writer, so I learned that stories have an arc. Did you know that? Not like the arc that Noah was on. They have an arc. The salvation arc is the main point of God's story. But ultimately, all the characters that Jesus touches are part of this main story in which he is glorified through healings and more so from salvation. So let's go back and let's look at this passage a little more carefully. The first few verses. Now, when Jesus returned... The crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. And as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. So I mentioned earlier, this is a big contrast from the group of people Jesus had just been around in the previous passage. They said, get out of here. We don't want you around here. You scare us with your holiness that has the ability to cast out demons and set a man at peace who had been at war with himself for all these years, they said, go away. This crowd welcomes Jesus. And we have this man, he's identified in the passage as Jairus, the ruler of a synagogue. And the best interpretation of that is the the ruler is not like a king of the synagogue. What he would have been is the person kind of responsible to make sure the synagogue is uh, functioning as it should. He would maybe schedule who's going to do the readings today, who's going to... Um, so maybe in a sense you could say he's the guy that set the order of service. We, we say we have an order of service for our morning worship or for a wedding or something. You have an order of service. And uh, so he's, he is important. He's a respected person. Um, but he's not in the sense of uh, being a spiritual like a priest or something he's he's a lay person that would be responsible for those things but still a respected position and what does he do he falls it says he fell at jesus feet and this is a sign of humility and he implored him implored is a strong word i implore you 
He implored Jesus to come. And why? He had an only daughter. She's 12. I used to have, I've had two 12-year-old daughters already. I'm going to have another 12-year-old daughter next year. Okay, some of you got that. I can understand how much he loved his daughter. For 12 years, she had his affection and likely demonstrated a lot of love to him as well. And now he's on the brink of losing her. She's so sick, she's on the way out, she's dying. God gives parents a love for their children, and we're desperate to take care of them. We're desperate to see them do well. We, we want the best for them. We empathize with Kevin and Janine right now because we know, those of us who are parents, when our children are not well, we are concerned, greatly concerned. But God, one of my favorite little short phrases in Scripture, but God. I think I did a sermon on that recently, didn't I? So let's look at that big idea again. I told you you're going to see this a number of times. Jesus responds to faith that is weak and desperate. Now, this man did not have faith like the centurion. Remember the centurion? He said, Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. I am a man under authority. He said, I know that you can make the command and my servant will be healed. This guy, maybe he just didn't think of that. I don't, it might have just never occurred to him that that could happen. Or maybe he had never heard the story of the centurion. Probably hadn't. Maybe his faith was a little weaker. But Christ responded to him. Thank God we have a Savior that loves to respond to weak faith and broken hearts. He responds to the fearful. He responds to the anxious. He responds to the tentative. All who come in sincerity, he responds to. He does not require perfect faith to act. Thank God for that. He only requires a submitted faith, a humble faith. There's a, a ser- one of the servant songs of Isaiah in Isaiah 42 In verse 3, it says, A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. In other words, Christ himself, he's he's not going to take the weak one and say, Okay, I'm just going to put you out of your misery. You're weak. I'm going to put you out. No, he doesn't do that. The weak one who comes to him with sincerity, he will respond to. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. In Psalm 18, 6, it says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. And in Psalm 34, starting at verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. I think that's where this man was. He's appealing from a desperate state, saying, I got nothing else here. All I can do is beg Jesus to help me. And the people press in. And Jesus is being crowded as he is going to see the man's daughter. And then in verse 43, there was a woman who had, a, had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She was constantly bleeding for 12 years. Now, the constant bleeding had many devastating effects for her, as you can well imagine. Loss of blood means loss of strength and energy, anemia, 
I found this almost two years ago, uh, within a month, when I was in the hospital and my blood was measuring very poorly and I was anemic, and I can tell you there's not much energy you have. So that would be one factor for certain. She would have been a weak woman. And then she would also be unclean, ceremonially unclean. Leviticus 15.25 says, If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. What does that mean? It means a lot in those days. It means she couldn't be with a husband. If she had a husband, he couldn't come with her because she was unclean. And it's possible that she had a husband, and because of that, he divorced her. I don't know. We, this, some commentators have conjectured that's a possibility because he could not have children with her because of this uncleanness. So uh, many men wouldn't stick with a woman like that. She could not go to the temple because of this uncleanness. So she couldn't participate in any of the religious uh, ceremonies or anything like that. She really could, was not supposed to touch anyone or be in their house to sit down. So she's cut off from family life, she's cut off from religious life, and she's cut off from community life. It's very sad. And she had spent all she had on doctors. Now, if you read Matthew, who also records this passage, he implies uh, that the doctors actually made her worse because he said she suffered under many doctors. And some uh, have said, well, Luke was a doctor, so he, was, he left that part out. Uh, he didn't want uh, the doctors getting bad rap off this. But uh, as I was uh, studying this passage, I found some of the amazing amazingly crazy remedies that they would try for women that had this condition and they were basically uh, superstitious stuff that she probably tried all of it so this is very one very sad and miserable case so what could she do what did she have left all she had was weak and desperate faith Verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. She touches the fringe. Some think this could be the tassels Jews wore on the edges of their clothing as prescribed to them in Leviticus. Um, And her condition didn't gradually get better. This was an immediate effect. So let's look at that big idea again. Don't forget this one. If you write down notes, you better have written this down by now. (laughs) But hopefully you'll remember it anyway when you go out. Jesus responds to faith that is weak and desperate. And we've seen the desperate father, the leader of the synagogue, whose 12 years of his daughter is threatening to come to an end. In his weakness and desperation, he falls before Christ. And we have this woman who had suffered for those same 12 years. The same 12 years where this man had the joy of having a daughter, this woman had 12 years of her condition. But both came weak and desperate to Jesus. And to both of them, Jesus responded. Verse 45, Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? And all that denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. This is an interesting question. To Peter, it sounds like it might be a little bit of a silly question. We're in a crowd. What do you mean, who touched you? A bunch of us touched you. We're all jostling together. I mean, you try to go out in a crowd and not bump into someone or brush against them. Who touched you? Are you kidding me? What do you mean? Now, when we see Jesus' question here, who touched me, let's not assume that meant he was unaware. You see, when Jesus asked a question of someone... It doesn't indicate that he didn't know, but his questions always have a reason behind them. Did he want the woman to testify as she did? Maybe. 
Did he want the public to know she's now clean? Maybe. Verse 45, Jesus said this, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. In other words, this isn't a normal touch. This wasn't someone just brushing against him that he was concerned about. It wasn't even someone pushing him. He perceived or discerned that power had gone out from him, and there was, this was not the normal touch of a crowd condition. This was a touch of weak, desperate faith. So what should this woman do now? She realizes she can't hide what's happened. So in verse 47, it says, when she saw she was not hidden, she came trembling. And you see this? She's still in a humble state. She's trembling. She's falling down before him. She declares in the presence of all the people why she touched him and how she had been immediately healed. So this is testimony time, right? She testifies to her desperate need And she testifies to being healed. And he answers her, verse 48, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, remember that this happened while Jesus was going with the synagogue ruler to his house, right? So they're on their way. So this is like the the subplot within the plot, or for those of you who play too many video games, this is a side quest, right? Uh, She... She comes into this situation. Jesus takes care of it, and he's about to go to his main uh, journey he was on to go with this man, and here we have this group. In verse 49, someone comes up to him and says, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. No point, right? Why, why have him come? There's, she's, it's too late to heal her. So we can imagine the sadness and the angst of this father to hear that. Ask a parent, if you know one, who has received the news of their child dying. doesn't matter the age. And I'm guessing they will probably tell you that not much competition exists for the grief of hearing that. The second part of the statement drives home the futility from a human standpoint of calling in a healer when the patient is dead. We we don't call doctors when someone dies. When someone dies, we might call the coroner or the mortician, but we don't call a doctor anymore. It's over. Now plan for the mourning and the funeral and the burial and all of those things, but the doctor is out of the picture, right? But God... Verse 50, but Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe. And she will be well. So Jesus gives encouragement. In every circumstance in life, when we are fearful or anxious, the scriptures clearly tell us that this is the formula we ought to exercise. Do not fear, only believe. There's a great hymn called Only Trust Him. Trust Him for salvation first and foremost, but only trust Him. And I'm going to read the words of this hymn. And I, Oh, they're really tiny on the screen. Sorry about that. I'll read them to you. Come, every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest by trusting in His word. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Only trust Him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes bright as snow. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Come then and join this holy band, and on to glory go to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. I guess some of you knew that. 
we have these words from Christ. Do not fear, only believe. Only trust him. This is often easier to say than do, by the way. Because we're weak. We're in human flesh. We're not able to do this perfectly. How can we do it? We need his word and we need his spirit to strengthen us to trust and believe. So never be slow to ask the spirit for his help. Again, I didn't plan this. I read from John 15 earlier where Jesus says, a helper is coming. Do not be slow to ask for his help. Ask him to strengthen you for the trusting and believing. Does that sound circular? It is in a sense. You need his help to strengthen you to trust and believe, and you need to believe that he will help you in order to ask him to trust and believe. So that's what we need to do. We need to allow him and ask him to strengthen us so that we can trust and believe and have the strength not to live in fear. So now in our story, we arrive at the house. In verse 51, he came to the house. He allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. So we see here, it's not always wise to do things publicly. I have witnessed people that are so-called faith healers, and they draw a lot of attention to themselves and what they're doing. They have people come to the stage. They have a big show of it. Sometimes it's not the best to do things publicly. Sometimes it's best to do them in a smaller setting. And Jesus had a reason for doing it this way. Now, it doesn't give the reason necessarily, but he did have a reason. He trusted Peter and John and James, so he brings them in, and the father and mother are allowed in. Of course, they should be. That's their daughter. And now this father with the weak and desperate faith is about to get rewarded for the weak and desperate faith. He's not being rewarded because he he said, I stand firm on the promises of God and I'm going to get blah, blah, blah. Hey, that's great. If you have a strong faith, I'm not putting that down by any means, believe me. But let's remember that many people in the church do not have a strong faith. They're, They're weak for whatever reason. But if they have a weak and desperate faith, Christ will still respond to that. Verse 52, all were weeping and mourning to her, for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. Well, we know and see here that there's always those who scorn Christ. Scoffers, right? They're always around. Sleeping is commonly used as a euphemism. In fact, in the New Testament, usually when it talks about believers who died, it says they fell asleep. And this shows that physical death is not the end for us. In this case, he was reviving her to her earthly existence. But for those in Christ, he will raise us to our eternal heavenly existence. When we awake from the sleep of death, it will be a refreshing morning. When have you had a great night's sleep? awoken completely refreshed, gone out and the sun was shining and it was a beautiful day and you feel just great. This is awesome. Life is good. Think of your best day ever. It cannot compare to the awakening in store for you if you trust in Christ. But what happens? Verse 53, they laughed at him knowing she was dead. Scoffers. Now we get to the climax of the story in verse 54. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. Who can resist the command of Christ to arise? Lazarus could not, and this child could not, and neither can anyone resist the command to believe when the Holy Spirit regenerates a heart and enables it to receive the gospel. This is called the irresistible grace. Anthony Hokema writes, the term irresistible grace conveys an important biblical truth. Regeneration is a monergistic, that means a work of one, not a synergistic, a work of two or more. It is not a work in which God and man cooperate, but it is a work of God alone. 
all that was said about the natural state of fallen human beings without effectual calling and about the way in which God regenerates his people supports the affirmation that the grace which regenerates us is indeed irresistible. And he goes on to say, the grace of God may indeed be resisted, but it will not be successfully resisted by those whom God has chosen in Christ to salvation from before the creation of the world. As Cornelius Plantinga aptly says, nobody can finally hold out against God's grace. Nobody can outlast him. Every elect person comes to give in and admit that God is God. End quote. In other words, those whom God has chosen from the beginning of the time will be his elect. As scripture teaches clearly, we, we will, they will not fail to respond to the gospel at the time that God has determined. The spiritually dead cannot resist that which God has commanded. Those Jesus healed, those he raised from the dead, could not have resisted his power to heal or bring life, even if they had somehow wanted to resist. His command to life is an absolute imperative from a sovereign. You cannot resist it. If you are able to resist it, you were never chosen for salvation. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. You see that in Romans 8 where it talks about that. It does not say some of those he predestined, he also called. And some of those he called, he also justified. No, he says those he predestined. All of them, they were called. All of them, they were justified. All of them, they were glorified. All of them. If you were predestined to salvation, you will be saved. You will not be able to resist this call. Jesus can command the dead to rise, and they must rise. Whether physically dead or spiritually dead, it doesn't matter. The effectual call of Christ can never be resisted for those that he predestined. And this is what happens here in verse 55. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Here's the happy ending of the story. And Jesus offers some practical advice. Feed your daughter. (laughs) She needs some lunch. It's practical, But not only that, but anyone who's gone through a long sickness or been at the bedside of someone at a long sickness, what is one of the signs that you've turned the corner very often? They are hungry. Can I have some cheeseburgers or whatever they ask for when they haven't eaten for a long time? That's the evidence very often that the illness is over, is that there's hunger. An appetite, in this case, is a thing of beauty. And so we come to the end of this great story. We see how it's weaved together in this beautiful way that the story is really about the salvation that God has planned from the beginning of time. And along with that, many other benefits, including healing, which we pray for because we believe that God is a healing God. But much more, he's a saving God who saves us from our sins, who saves us from the wrath of God, Romans 5, 9, who gives us peace with God, Romans 5, 1. And he loved us before he, while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. I thought I'd throw that in, Leland, because he likes that one. He is a saving God. Only trust him. He responds to faith that is weak and desperate. And may this be an encouragement to anyone here, all of us really, but especially if you felt my faith is just not there. And I'm going through this at work. I'm going through this difficulty with a family member. I don't know how we'll reconcile. I'm going through this with a sick friend. I'm going through this with my kids, my parents, whatever it might be. And you're like, my faith is just not enough. It sounds good for you, pastor up there. You're, you're so strong in faith. Yeah, right. If you have 
at least a weak and desperate faith cry out to Christ. That's what he responds to. A bruised reed he will not break. In fact, he greatly loves to hear from the one with a broken and contrite heart. And he will save you, as the song said. Only trust him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word this morning, and I pray that it may be an encouragement to all. But especially, Lord, those who are in these situations that seem just untenable, like they can't survive there. Like, unless something changes, Lord, it's, it's just not going to work. And, th- and yet they think, my faith is just not there. I'm not strong enough in faith, Lord. May they be encouraged by the faith of Jairus, the synagogue leader, who bowed down to Christ and begged, implored. And this woman, Lord, who couldn't even come to him face to face, was so scared and so tentative that all she felt is, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And both of these, Lord, have a testimony now that you, Lord, respond to weak and desperate faith. And so, Lord, there's no one here that doesn't have just a little bit of faith that could not cry out to you. Because you said if our faith is even that of a mustard seed, you can cause it to grow. Lord, if anyone has been restrained in asking for your spiritual help in their life, May those shackles be broken and may they feel free to pray and ask you for the help they need. Whether they are weak or desperate, Lord, or those here that have strong faith, may all of us continually go before the throne of grace in the name of Jesus Christ that you may help us in our times of need. And may you bless your church, Lord, this day. In Jesus' name.